Welcome to 22 Motivational Minutes with Marlo, where I help passionate entrepreneurs condense an hour of business research into 22 minutes of powerful conversations filled with knowledge, stories, and advice to help you achieve your one-year goal in 90 days. From national stages to your earbuds, I'm here to tell you that it's possible to have a profitable and sustainable business without the fear of overwhelm and uncertainty that comes with being an entrepreneur. It's all mojo and none of the fluff. It's time to get motivated in 22 minutes. All right, welcome back to 22 Minutes to Having It All podcast. And today we welcome Craig Montz. Now, the reason I'm excited to have Craig is because there is a sound person here. I mean, this this gentleman, you are passionate about three really good things. I mean, you've got a plethora of them. But I mean, you are a family person. There's no question that, you know, you're a father of three. You love the outdoors. You just happen to be in the construction business. But I mean, if if anybody knows Craig, you know that those three things are of value to you. You've been a previous client. You know, you were in our book, The Making of a Maverick. You are a true maverick. I mean, I know just working with you, you've always tried to strive to be that top 2%. And I think some of our conversation is going to take that today. But then you and I have just had a synergy and a connection. I mean, we've known each other for a very long time. And so I'm just really excited to have you on today's episode, Craig. Perfect. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Okay. So the reason we want to talk to you is because you are such a vested family man. You look at life just outside the work sphere. Because like when I say we knew value the outdoors, I mean, you have a lot of passions that you pursue and you love to make those, incorporate those into your daily life. But then you also focus in the construction sector. So can you, as I'm describing those three things, like what is your thought as you hear me describe you in that way? So managing time is, is always a challenge. So that's something that I believe I do well. My days aren't always scripted or planned. Um, I've got about 10 activities a week that I have to do in any given timeline to make the week work better. So let's say there's a certain reports that have to be done on a certain day, maybe certain activities that need to be done as far as forecasting resources. And what I do is I, I set those up so that on any given day, I've got two to three of those that I have to do on that day of the week. But the time is not as critical to me. Uh, I start my day somewhere in the office so between 6 and 6.30 on any given day. And with that time, I use that time to take care of that item that's going to uh, require the most brain capacity or, or just wear me down potentially. So that uh, habit of forming, of having that those two or three items to do right away. It's tough to do those right away because a lot of times they're repeatable tasks. There are things that don't require as high of a function to execute. But I know that I have to get them done that day to make my week flow better. But I do allow that that to slide. And then when I go home at the end of the day, that that gives me, when those things are executed, I'm able to focus on my family when I get home. Yeah. Okay, so then here's what I'm hearing you say. I mean, so how do you set and then enforce these healthy boundaries that support this structure for you? Like for you personally, like, I mean, you've got a structure and you know what needs to get done. So you're prioritizing, but then how are you enforcing the boundary that's allowing you to actually make it a reality? I've had a whiteboard through the years. I've done checklists in my notebook. And what I've found is I just have created the, something that works well for me. I set it up. It, just using note tabs and I've got, okay, Monday, I've got these activities to do Tuesday. I've got these activities to do, but then I have uh, in that, in this uh, whiteboard that I essentially carry with me, uh, I've got a working on area. I've got an urgent area. I've got a, just a to do list. And then what really throws me off is when I execute and get something accomplished, but then I have to turn it over to somebody else. And then I'm waiting on a response from that person. That's probably the hardest thing to manage because it's outside of my hands. So I've, I've done a lot better job of just saying, okay, well, I've executed my piece, but I'm waiting on this. So how do I track that, right? Yeah, and that's going to be different for everybody. And that's powerful. And, and there's a burden, I think, that goes with that too. I mean, because you are passing it, but it is out of your hands. And so now it's just kind of a follow-up component component just to make sure that it, nothing slips through the cracks is what I'm hearing. But, but those things help me set that boundary of, of when I leave at the end of the day, I can look at, at my whiteboard, it's very visual, and just say, okay, well, what, what's left on my, on my list that's urgent? Uh, can I assign that to a certain day of the week? Uh, what's left 
that I'm working on? Did I, did I get everything done that, that I started with? And it helps me keep track of my day that way. Uh, mm-hmm. And then it leaves a lot less of those thoughts in the back of my mind. Right. So, okay, are you ever afraid that saying no is going to cost you? Is that ever a fear that you have about saying no to something? Yes, yes, that's a huge fear. Um, that's one of my challenges with overcommitment is is saying no to others. One of the, the values I feel that I provide, at least the networks I'm a part of, is the willingness to say yes. Do you feel like you're sacrificing anything because you do? Well, you know, it's that old uh, saying that what you say yes to now means you're saying something, saying no to something else, potentially. But yeah, I certainly sacrifice a lot of things by saying yes. So, I mean, have you ever come to the point where, I mean, you want more downtime with family or you deal with guilt around that, around those boundaries and building structure around it? Give me some insight for that. So family is pretty firm. Luckily, my wife has high expectations, so. So she keeps you on your toes. <laughs> she does keep me on my toes, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. I do everything I can to be home by 6.30 at night. Actually, I, I make it my target to be home by 6, but 6.30 is kind of the, the drop dead. I, I know that if I'm in the middle of something, I just need to stop and, and get away. Luckily, my like I said, I, I wear out as the day goes on. And by the time I get to the end of the day, oftentimes I'm, I'm just ready to be done. I'm not as productive anyway. Yeah. 12 hour day. I mean, that's pretty extreme. And yeah, you're right in the industry that you're in. There's just, there's a lot of moving parts and I can completely understand that. You know, so here's another question I have too. Blind spots, right? How do you reveal your own blind spots? Well, I try to pay attention if somebody points them out to me. I know I have blind spots. Uh, People point them out to me from time to time. And sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Mm-hmm. But that's why it's good to have people like you around, Marlo, that can help identify those blind spots. Yeah, I mean, and I think they're a reality. I mean, I think that it's common for everybody. But but listening to you, I mean, you know that they exist. And again, you're a great communicator, Craig. So you're able to say, hey, if you see a blind spot or if you see something, you know, let's talk about it. But how common is that? How How often do you find that in the workplace? Well, so intuition seems to be something that not everyone has, and and maybe everyone's definition of intuition is a little bit different, but intuition, working with some folks, they only have the capacity to have information fed to them uh, of what's directly in front of them at that moment and and don't want the the big picture. And other folks, they want the big picture, and they uh, they can fill in the details and get the work done. Is, is trying to identify who you're talking with. Yeah. Do you think experience has a key factor in that intuition? I think it can be taught through it. experience. I think some people naturally have more than others. I do believe it can be taught. Yeah. And here's the thing. I always like to say that intuition is your oracle, right? It can be your best asset and it can really take you places if you give it the power. And if you just know that you just kind of go with that inner feeling and, you know, your intuitive spirit towards the approach, I think that's very powerful. How do you respond to that? I think it helps with with problem solving. And a lot of it goes back to that idea of pattern recognition. Your your mind recognizes a pattern that exists or or could exist and, and you're able to connect those dots. Everyone having that capacity or capability, I I don't think it's ingrained in everyone, but some folks are better at it than others. Yeah. You know, and I'm kind of hitting you on some of these, these bigger pieces here only because I know you're conditioned. I mean, I've known you for a long time and I've witnessed your growth and, and the ways that you have approached things. You know, I also think that overthinking, decision-making that can cause a, a large part of overwhelm for us. Has that ever limited your growth at all? I'm curious. So when, when I hear overthinking, I, I think of perfectionism. I try not to spend a lot of time overthinking items or, or making things too perfect. Uh, I believe those are a form of procrastination or a reason not to get something done. I like to execute. As soon as I have the bare minimum of information to make a decision, I'm quick to make a decision. Oftentimes, if you make a decision, you can work your way back out of a mistake by making more decisions. Right. And over time, I think you're validating yourself. And so you're able to make these solid decisions easily because you're trusting yourself, right? Right. I think that's 
that idea of overthinking or perfectionism, you know, I will go back and reflect and maybe think about how I could have done a situation differently, but yeah, that helps build that pattern recognition, uh, going back to the idea of intuition, but execution, you can have the greatest ideas in the world, but if you don't ever execute then then nobody ever gets a chance to see those. Hey, so you do use the word execute a lot. And, and we know that, I mean, you're an action taker, right? You don't sit on the sidelines. You don't watch it. Like I said, coming into this episode, I mean, you strive to be that top 2%, that maverick, that person who makes the decision, takes the action, gets an outcome. And, and that's very, very powerful. But have you had to learn that over time? Or are there lessons, Craig, that you've either adopted or experienced that have allowed you to get into that space of, of execution? Well, well, don't get me wrong. I've made plenty of mistakes for sure <laughs> as, as part of the process, but right. I, I try to reflect and learn from that. As far as I, I've been the benefactor of, of attrition and been able to move up within my career for, for various reasons, but it's put me in a position where I've had to make decisions on things that I didn't know all of the information going into those those tasks or those items to make those decisions. And sometimes they've worked out really well. So other times they haven't worked out as well, but I, I've always learned. I think there's some value in having mistakes happen. I think there's value in having successful outcomes. As long as you take the time to reflect and learn, you can learn from both. Right. Yeah. And the way that I always look at reflection, I mean, I use that as a safety net, right? Because we can catch those mistakes before they become ingrained habits in how we execute over and over again. How do you look at that reflection piece? Is that how you see it? Anymore, I try to use it as, as self-study a lot of times. I, I recognize when I get upset about something. I recognize when something makes me happy and I've got that feeling of joy. And I, and I try to go back and identify, okay, why was I upset about this? And it, it may be something small that sets me off. Maybe whoever I was, I was with at the time didn't recognize or see that I was upset, but I, I, I'd say, okay, well, what made me upset in that situation? And then go back and say, was that warranted? Why, why did that happen? And, and try to understand that. Yeah. Okay. So as a provider, as an achiever, are you ever afraid that your life won't have any meaning? I know that's a big question, but give me, as you hear me ask that, give me your insight into, uh, into you know, being afraid that your life won't have meaning. So I, I've got a strange desire to be known why I, I really couldn't say, but I've got that strange desire to be known as far as being a provider with my family. I, I live uh, what I believe is, is some multiple areas of life. My, my family life is very separate from my work life. A lot of people talk about work-life balance. They talk about work-life integration. My family happens to live uh, more than 45 minutes from where I work. It's very difficult to get them involved in my work life. I'm a pretty outgoing social person. I uh, like to interact with others in the community, uh, but I've got the community where I work. I've got a community at home, I'm trying to be that provider, trying to understand where I might be a community leader versus uh, just a plus one to whomever I'm with. I, I guess I've just always wanted to be known for some reason. Yeah. Okay, so just to validate you, because you know I'm big on validation, I mean, the reason I'm calling on you, like I have a roster of hundreds of people, and when I was looking to go into this episode, as we're shifting into somewhat of a new platform, you're the first person I thought of. So you have that desire to be known. You are known, and I guess I just want to share with you, I mean, you're the first person I want to call on and have this conversation just because we do know each other, and, and I've just seen so many powerful things that you've done. And I know the position that you've put yourself in. So again, I just, just to validate, I, I, people do know who you are. But now, why do you say it's a strange desire? I mean, seriously, <laughs> that's a different way to. <laughs> that's definitely a desire that, that people recognize exists. It's not something that a lot of people come out and say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I did some self-study back 2012, glorified was one of my words. I just really felt the need to be glorified. And I know that sounds like so panache, right? It's like, really? But there is something. There's this inner desire that we have. And um, yeah, there's something to be said for it. So kudos to you for, you know, for knowing yourself like that. Yeah, I, I, always, I always enjoy when people say, hey, Craig, you, you know everybody. And, and the, the fact of the matter is I can go into a large banquet hall and I don't know a lot of the folks in the room. But uh, 
it's, it's, it's always interesting hearing people say, Hey, you know, everybody. And I don't feel that way. Mm. Okay. So how do you use that connector strength? Because there's an asset there. I definitely leverage the connection. People around me are the experts. I, I like to think of myself as a self-proclaimed generalist, but uh, depending on the room, I, I can be the expert in a situation, but I like to know on who those experts are that I can call on. Yeah. But I think you've conditioned yourself. I mean, that you see others as experts. And I also, yeah, I love to say that, you know, there's people that are 10 times smarter than me in the room, but I never let that intimidate me. Instead, I'm like, I want to learn from you. I mean, that's just my approach. That's why I have like ferocious energy to, to connect with them. How do you relate to that? I love learning and I, I like trying to understand what people, what makes people tick and, and what they do offer. And then how, how can I help leverage that? And the relationships that I have, there's people that may need something that somebody that I just met, they're able to offer uh, support with. Yeah. Okay. So let's have that conversation of balance because uh, uh, people are interested. You know, we've talked about you being a provider and a, a father of three. I mean, you've got twins, you've got a little boy. I mean, this is like, you know, that's a phenomenal task. You're amazing at what you do in your professional career, but let's talk outdoors for a little bit. You know, how do you put all of this together and make it a win for you? Well, I try to make sure that I get seven hours of sleep on average, I would say every night. So sleep's a pretty important factor for a lot of a lot of people and, and a hot topic at times. So seven hours of sleep a night, but you bring that to the outdoors. I don't spend a lot of time watching TV, having a young family. I like to get time in the outdoors uh, without them because when I do take them, it's a lot of work, but a lot of memories made. But there are times I just want to get out and do that on my own. I go early in the mornings when they might still be sleeping on the weekend. And then when I get a chance to take them out later in the day, I'm, I'm refreshed and uh, ready to take on whatever that, that opportunity is. But when, when you take young children outside, it, it tends to be a lot of work, but there's a lot of fun memories. Yeah. And here's the thing too. I mean, you know how to find your own joy. I mean, like you're carving out space because that's a joy for you. I mean, you're hunting and you're fishing, all of those things. But that just makes you a better provider. It makes you, you know, amazing at work just because I think it, it makes you more of a rounded person and kudos to you for being able to fit it all in. Now, I'm going to go back to an early question. Like when you were in your 20s, Craig, did you see your life played out like it is now? Yeah, I did not have a good plan of what I was going to do. I definitely didn't have things sequenced out on, hey, I'm going to do this step and this step and this step in life. I floated through life, took on whatever came my way. And I would say I'm more deliberate now at this point in my life, having others that I'm responsible for maybe has caused or created some of that uh, deliberate nature or, or trying to make sure that I'm, I'm focusing on the right things. But in my 20s, I, I did not have that much scripted out in my life. I, I didn't know where to go. So was there a catalyst moment that changed it besides having a family? Was that the change or... Was there more? Probably. I've, I've always been a high achiever, just as part of who I'm ingrained to be. Some of that leaves me with the idea of imposter syndrome or things never quite ever being good enough. I think you and I have uh, actually had some of that conversations in the past, but I'm always achieving to make things a little bit better. Yeah. Well, challenge is satisfying. You know, when you say you like to find out what makes people tick, I mean, just because you're always in pursuit of the challenge, it's actually very satisfying for you to have a challenge to overcome or to um, to solve. I definitely create plenty of opportunity for challenge in my day to day work. Just if, if I feel things are to where I'm comfortable, that makes me uncomfortable. So I, I like to push the edge. I like a, a little bit of a thrill seeker have a little bit of that stress and chaos in my life just to push that limit. Okay. So we're coming into the close. This is the final question, you know, and, and going through this process and repositioning, I love to help people, you know, understand what having it all means. What does having it all mean to you, Craig? I believe having it all would feel like financial security. I'm not real far into my career at this point. I, I definitely don't have that today with three young kids and, and a family at home. And I'm not in a position where I feel financially secure. I think having it all would be having enough passive income to cover my expenses. I don't know if that's true or not. I, I don't know that. 
Yeah. Well, and I know that you've always been focused on that again, because you're a high achiever. I mean, I think that will always be one of those hooks that you choose to hang things on is, is that financial security. I mean, that's just being responsible. But when you hear somebody say, you know, or even hear the, the statement of having it all, what's the first thing you think of besides like financial security? I mean, but take yourself out of that. What is the first thing you hear? Well, it'd be, be happiness. So mm-hmm. well, whatever that, that means, uh, lack of want, maybe. I'm not sure what, what that is, that contentment. I tend to have a little bit of, little bit of uh, imposter syndrome, always the wanting to achieve to make things better, uh, that contentness. Um, I don't, I'm not sure. That, that's what I, what I believe that, that that would be, I guess. Yeah. So when I look at having it all, it's that peaceful achievement, right? It's achieving at a very, very high level, but in pursuit of that race, being able to walk the dog, being able to be with the family, being able to take a vacation, you know, and having peace and peace is just present. I'm not worried about what next month brings or what we did six months ago, but like being right here right now, that is having it all. How do you relate to that? Now, that is a great definition of having it all, that peace of mind that a person can have. That sounds great. Yeah. And, and that's why, you know, I, I am switching into this because, you know, over time we all evolve, right? Our brand has evolved as you've witnessed and, you know, we're prepping for the next book that we write. And it's really anchored in this space of the questions that you and I are, you know, going around today and, and understanding, but like peaceful, energized, empowered, and loved. Those four words are how I love to show up every single day. Do you have any word as we're closing out? Are there any words that you stand tall in, Craig? I think somebody taught me to have a word to define each year. And I believe that person was you. Let me, I I don't have it on the tip of my tongue here for what that word is. Let's see. I've got it written down here somewhere. No fear is the word that I focused on this year. Obviously I could do a little better job of focusing on it, but uh, really no fear would be, it would be a great achievement to have that. And uh, this is a great reminder as I enter the second half of the year to put emphasis on that. Yeah, yeah. Run fast, live fearless. I love that that saying. And again, it doesn't mean that like, yeah, you're untouchable, but like just not giving fear the power, but just like doing what you're doing, showing up, accepting the challenge, being in present. And I think that right there is is has so much more. So Anything before we end this episode, Craig, that, that you want to mention about the conversation that we've had today? Any last words about this? This is great. I, I think where you're headed is, is terrific. And the idea of helping people live a different lifestyle, that, that's terrific. So I, I like where you're headed. Mm, thank you. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that. And that's that's why I wanted to have this conversation because I knew you would be the person that we can embrace these, you know, these things with. And like I said, I mean, we're, we're going into the unknown, but as we've evolved and the more that I've witnessed and, and the change that has come with, you know, the pandemic and how things have shifted for people, I think there's a greater need and desire to immerse ourselves into some of these types of conversations to reveal some of the things that we talked about in blind spots and time and priority and, you know, family, all of these things, because, you know, we only get one shot. And to show up in the best way possible. I love other people hearing how others are doing it and their approach to it. You know, nobody's perfect. We're never aiming for perfect. I don't ever want that. But I'm just really appreciative that uh, you were able to give us time today and uh, to have this conversation. So thank you so much. Yeah, you're the coach to having it all. I am. <laughs> yes, I am. And uh, and I'm excited and I'm fully embracing it. So yeah, I can't wait to, to see what this does and you know how it impacts people in a way that, that it will. And like you, service is my thing. Yeah, I'm here to, to help. So where can we find you? If somebody wants to learn about you, Craig, you are a connector. You're very focused on service. Um, where are ways that we can connect? Well, I'm pretty easy to find. The platform I use the most would be would be LinkedIn. So you can find me there. I'm not going to be hard to find. Anybody that wants to know more or, or get to know me, they can pop in on LinkedIn. Yeah, excellent. All right, my friend. Hey, thank you so much. And uh, this is just such a powerful conversation. So thanks, Craig. All right. Thank you. 
Did you enjoy this podcast? If so, subscribe, leave a review, and tell your friends. As your Chief Inspirational Officer, I coach passionate entrepreneurs like you to achieve complete confidence and clarity to reach your one-year goal in 90 days. Learn how you can get more done in less time with my number one proven formula for consistency and clarity. Simply go to go.marlohiggins.com to download. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll catch you next week on 22 Motivational Minutes with Marlo. Marlo.